I've always been a logical and curious kind of person. I mean, that's just my personality. I remember when I was little, my parents gave me an electric train for Christmas. And then a couple hours later, my dad finds me in the garage and I'm throwing the locomotive against the cement floor, trying to break it open. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just trying to figure out how it works. I mean, my parents, because of all the why questions I would ask, finally went out and said, here, and they bought me an encyclopedia and said, look, the answers are in there. Go look for them. Go find them yourself. I mean, that's just the way I was. And so I guess it's natural that I would become a journalist because journalists are looking for facts. They're looking for evidence. They're looking for data. They're looking for something that they can publish in the paper and have confidence it is true. Lee Strobel earned a Master of Studies in Law degree from Yale Law School and is the former legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He is the best-selling author of several books that explore the evidence for the Christian faith. I guess given uh, my curiosity, it's not surprising that when I was in high school, science was my favorite topic because there the teachers actually encouraged me to like cut open frogs and find out how things work, which I thought was great. When I was a teenager, I had this deep trust in science and I think part of it was prompted by the fact that I grew up in post-Sputnik America where Eisenhower encouraged all young people to delve into science so we could catch up with the Russians. So to me, science sort of represented the empirical, the hard facts, the things that could be proven experimentally, and that was sort of the way in which I looked at life. I thought people who had faith, people who believed in supernatural things like God, I saw that as a sign of weakness because, you know, do you have any data to back that up? In the autumn of 1966, Strobel's interest in science led to a life-changing decision. I can take you back to the exact spot where I was sitting. It was in the third floor overlooking the asphalt parking lot. I was in the second row, the third chair from the front. When my biology teacher recounted in great detail this experiment that had been conducted in the early 1950s at the University of Chicago. This experiment that impressed Strobel so deeply was one of the most famous in the history of science. In 1953, Stanley Miller, a graduate chemistry student, tried to demonstrate how life first emerged on Earth. Miller attempted to reproduce the Earth's early atmosphere. He pumped hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and a small amount of water vapor into a maze of glassware. Then sparked the gases with electrical discharges to simulate lightning. After five days, he discovered what he had hoped for, a few simple amino acids, the basic building blocks of living organisms, had collected in the dark residue at the bottom of the glass. Many hailed Miller's experiment as proof that essential components of life could have formed in the oceans of the Earth billions of years ago. The philosophical implications of Miller's experiment were instantly obvious to me. And for me, it was a eureka moment because I heard this and I thought, wait a minute. If you can show scientifically that life can emerge without any outside assistance, if life can emerge just from naturalistic circumstances, then God was out of a job. From there, the acceptance of Darwinian evolution and full-blown atheism, for that matter, was pretty easy. Because if living organisms could emerge by themselves out of this primordial soup without the assistance of any kind of a god or, or supernatural intervention, then they certainly could develop naturally over the eons into more and more complex creatures, just as Charles Darwin theorized in his book on the origin of species. As Strobel embraced Darwinism and its atheistic implications, he was surprised to discover that many Christians believe their faith was compatible with Darwinian evolution. There's no way you can harmonize neo-Darwinism with Christianity. I could never understand Christians who would say, well, you know, I believe in God, and yet I believe in evolution as well. You see, Darwin's ideas about the development of life led to his theory that modern science now generally defines as an undirected process, completely devoid of any purpose or plan. Now, how could God direct an undirected process? How could God have purpose and a plan behind a system 
that has no plan and no purpose. It just does not make sense. Didn't make sense to me in 1966, and it doesn't make sense to me now. In 1972, Lee Strobel married Leslie Hurdler. Five years later, Leslie, an agnostic, became a Christian. And I thought, this is divorce. This is gonna be the end of our marriage. But all the negative things I expected to happen in her as a result of her newfound faith, they didn't happen. And instead, I saw positive changes in her values and her character and the way she related to me and the children. And I thought, wait a minute, she is attributing this to God. And I don't believe God exists. And so that was the main thing that prompted me to say, maybe I need to really investigate this and get to the bottom of this and determine, is there really any rational way I could ever believe that this kind of a God really exists and really causes this kind of transformation in a human being? And so I decided to use my legal training and journalism training, my scientific curiosity, to systematically investigate, is there any credibility to the Christian faith? Because science had played such an instrumental role in his turn to atheism, Strobel embarked on an investigation of major discoveries in biology, chemistry, cosmology, and physics. His studies spanned more than 20 years and included interviews with scientists and scholars as he sought to determine for himself what these discoveries implied about the reality of a creator. Throughout his inquiry, one question remained constant. Does the evidence uncovered by contemporary science point us toward or away from the existence of God? Two-time Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling once said that science should be the search for truth. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know where the evidence was ultimately going to take me, but I really did want to know the truth about God. And what I found shocked me and it stunned me. Strobel's search began with an examination of evidence that challenged materialistic theories of life's origin. He discovered that this negative evidence contradicted the textbook explanations that had once convinced him the blind forces of evolution could account for the creation and diversity of life on Earth. A good example of negative evidence is the 1953 origin of life experiment by Stanley Miller, the one that helped lead me into atheism in the first place. As biologist Jonathan Wells explained to me, Miller's experiment has now been thoroughly discredited. Stanley Miller put together a glass apparatus and in that apparatus he put a mixture of gases that people at the time thought reflected the atmosphere of the early Earth. And those gases were methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. But then the professional opinion of what was there on the early Earth changed in the 60s, geochemists uh, revised their hypothesis and decided that the hydrogen, being very light, would have escaped into outer space. The Earth's gravity isn't strong enough to hold it. And probably the early Earth's atmosphere then consisted of what we now see coming out of volcanoes today, namely carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. Well, if the early Earth's atmosphere consisted of those gases, then Stanley Miller's experiment would not work. In fact, he himself tried it with those gases, and he found that uh, he couldn't produce any amino acids at all. So the experiment falls apart once you use a more realistic mixture of gases in the apparatus. Miller's test has been repeated many times using the correct atmospheric components. The results are always the same. The amino acids that generated so much enthusiasm in 1953 do not appear. Even if Miller's experiment were valid, you're still light years away from making life. It comes down to this. No matter how many molecules you can produce with early Earth conditions, plausible conditions, you're still nowhere near producing a living cell. And here's how I know. If I take a sterile test tube and I put in a little bit of fluid with just the right salts, 
just the right balance of acidity and alkalinity, just the right temperature, the perfect solution for a living cell. And I put in it one living cell. This cell is alive, it has everything it needs for life. Now I take a sterile needle and I poke that cell and all its stuff leaks out into this test tube. You have in this nice little test tube all the molecules you need for a living cell. Not just the pieces of the molecules, but the molecules themselves. And you cannot make a living cell out of them. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So what makes you think that a few amino acids dissolved in the ocean are going to give you a living cell? It's totally unrealistic. Stanley Miller's experiment was not the only unsuccessful attempt to explain how life originated. Beginning with Russian chemist Alexander Oparin's work in the 1920s, theorists have also proposed chance, chemical attraction, and biological seeding from outer space as possible answers. Each has failed to account for how non-living chemicals could have arranged themselves into the most basic components of the first living cell. Strobel's research ultimately led him to conclude that materialistic explanations for the origin of life were deeply flawed. And his examination of negative evidence did not end with the question of first life. He also learned of weaknesses in the most celebrated icon of Darwinian evolution. In Darwin's book on the origin of species, there's only one illustration. It's called the tree of life. Darwin used it to explain how every species of animal and plant that ever existed on Earth had evolved from the same common ancestor through small, gradual steps over enormous periods of time. Even though Darwin's Tree of Life is included in virtually every biology textbook published over the last half century, contrary to what we've been told, there is no conclusive evidence of the common origin of all life. Perhaps the most damaging blow to Darwin's theory is the fossil record. If all living organisms have descended from the same primitive life form, then the rock strata of the Earth should be filled with the fossilized remains of animals that were once part of a great evolutionary chain. A chain of small biological modifications ultimately leading to a spectacular diversity of life. Yet, after two centuries of research, highlighted by excavations in southern China, the multitude of transitional experiments, or missing links, that should exist are conspicuous only by their absence. The most graphic example of this void in the fossil record is a geological era known as the Cambrian Explosion. The branching tree pattern of Darwin's theory is actually not seen anywhere in the fossil record unless we impose it with our own minds. So the Cambrian explosion is the most dramatic refutation of the tree of life. The Cambrian explosion of life was a dramatic episode in geological history. Usually dated at about 530 million years ago, the exquisitely preserved Cambrian fossils reveal that the body plans for virtually every major animal phyla appeared, not gradually and slowly as Darwin had speculated, but instead, with astonishing suddenness. If we imagine the whole history of life on Earth taking place in one 24-hour period, the current uh, standard estimates for the origin of life put it at about 3.8 billion years ago, let's say 4 billion. So if we start the clock then, our 24-hour clock, six hours, nothing but these simple single-celled organisms appear, the same sort that we saw in the beginning. 12 hours, same thing. 18 hours, same thing. Three quarters of the day has passed and all we have are these simple single-celled organisms. Then at about the 21st hour, in the space of about two minutes, boom, most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And many of them persist to the present and we have them with us today less than two minutes out of a 24-hour period. That's how sudden the Cambrian explosion was. 
In a geological instant, the animal kingdom leaped from small, relatively simple organisms to extraordinary creatures with spinal cords, compound eyes, and articulated limbs. The record of this explosion of life looks nothing like Darwin's slowly branching tree. Darwin's theory is that there's a tree of life where you have one organism diverging into many other organisms and big differences appearing at the top. What we really see is from here up. This does not exist in the fossil record. If I were using a botanical illustration, it would be a lawn with separate blades of grass sprouting independently of each other. And those would be the phyla. Now within each phylum, there is subsequent diversification. But even there, I don't see the branches connecting that would make them a tree of life. As scientists, it's not our job to force the evidence into a theory that just doesn't fit it. And so I have absolutely no desire or reason to uphold Darwin's theory at this point. I think what we're seeing today is a series of scientific discoveries that are opening the eyes of more and more scientists to say, wait a minute, I can no longer believe that pure naturalistic processes can account for the origin and diversity of life. There must be something else here. The challenges to Darwinian theory have led more than 600 scientists with PhDs from major universities throughout the world to sign a document titled, A Scientific Descent from Darwinism. It reads in part, we are skeptical of the claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. These are scientists with PhDs from Stanford and Berkeley and University of Chicago and Cambridge, major universities, who've looked hard and fast at the evidence and have walked away saying, I am not convinced. Maybe there's another explanation. Personally, the negative evidence forced me to conclude that Darwinism would require a blind leap of faith that I just had no good reason to make. Strobel's rejection of Darwinism and materialistic science was also based on the large body of positive evidence for intelligent design. Evidence he first confronted in the science of cosmology, which explores the origin of the universe. Thank you.